Everybody get your Bibles open, please. Amen. When you see me start heading toward this pulpit, turn that thing on. Because that's the way I'm going to do. All right. Judges. The book of Judges. Everybody get your Bibles open. And uh, we're going to start tonight. We've been looking forward to this for a long time. I've had requests from two different states wondering when we was going to do this. <laughs> people out there waiting to hear it. And, I, and uh, a lot of people ask, so... We're going to take tonight the book of Judges in the Old Testament, uh, right after Joshua. The book of Joshua is the book of victory. The book of Judges is the book of defeat. Uh, it'd be a good way to describe it. Many of them, actually. The book of Joshua. Uh, J- Joshua means Jesus, same same word as Jesus. Jehovah saves. Uh, Judges is characterized by that one verse, the very last verse in the book. Normally, when you study a book like this, you don't start at the back, but let's all turn to the very last chapter, chapter 21, and this summarizes what's taking place here in the book of Judges. Uh, Tonight, we'll look at it and see what it says here. The very last verse of chapter 21 says, In those days there was no king in Israel, Every man did that which is right in his own eyes. And there's the situation here in the book of Judges. Everybody just did whatever they thought was right. They did it, and you had absolute chaos. You had anarchy. You had a a mess, to put it lightly. So the key verse to understand in the book of Judges would be that verse, that very last verse. It's amazing how that God put that in there. Every man did that which was right, in his own eyes. So the book of Judges, written somewhere between 1400 and 1200 B.C., would be after the time of Moses, but before the time of the kings, when they started having kings. And there's this period in there where everybody, I mean, it was just ridiculous, chaos. And um, the Lord wanted to be their ruler, and they didn't want him to, and they demanded a king, and he wound up giving them Saul. That's how they got... Saul as king, and so forth and so on. But anyway, let's start tonight. Got your Bibles open? Yeah, we go. The book of Judges has 21 chapters. It has 618 verses, 18,976 inspired words. We believe it just like it recorded it here and preserved in our King James Bible for the English-speaking people and uh, needs no help or correction from anybody. And uh, the book of Judges teaches... One, well, a lot, but one major truth. And we're not going to get far past the introduction tonight. After, next, after tonight, we're going to move a lot faster. But tonight, we're going to talk about the great truth that's predominant in the book of Judges. And that is the great law of human collapse. And that simply means the book of Judges and world history is a complete, complete contradiction to the theory and religion we know as evolution. And evolution teaches everything's getting better gradually all the time. The book of Judges teaches that unless God intervenes, man just goes from bad to worse. It's always been that way, ever civilization that way, and we know that as the second law of thermodynamics. That's what they teach you in science. The second law of thermodynamics said... Everything deteriorates with time. You want it in easy, plain language? Your watch runs down. The lights burn out. The paint gets old. The car wears out. That's the uh, universal law, and the book of Judges teaches that. It means watches run down. Now, most of us don't have these. uh, My watch here, this one that Kelly bought me, this thing... You can see the guts in this thing working, and I think movement, movement makes my watch uh, keep running. If you take that watch off and leave it alone, it stops. That's the book of Judges. Now, when it stops, I grab it. I'm an outside force. I'm an outside force. It takes calories. I burn calories reaching for this thing and putting it on my arm. That's expenditure of energy. I'm putting energy into it, and then it gets going. It winds it up again. My arm moving makes it go. 
That's intervention. If you leave it alone, it just stops. Now, when God, man without God goes downhill, and that is completely opposite from what you're taught by the humanist and by uh, modern day belief in, in, in the world, they want, they want to teach you that um, in postgraduate studies and stuff like that, they, they want to give you this impression that the world's getting better because we got better gadgets and we got better communication and travel, we're getting better. But man ain't no better than he ever has been, y'all. We have better means of communication and travel. That's, that's a scientific advancement, communication and travel. Other than that, we're the same old sorry human beings they've always been and, and, and probably worse uh, with, without God. Now, uh, uh, when an outside force comes in and winds it up, it starts again. Um, it, like I said, it burns cow. Your car is like that. If you leave your car alone, it will rot. The tires will rot off of it. You know, I've even heard, I've even heard people say, you better off drive them every now and then than just let one set uh, forever. Uh, and you leave it alone, it will sit there and rot and turn to a junk pile. If you drive it, it'll turn to a junk pile. The only way you can keep a car going is, is just keep messing with it and messing with it. You got to change the oil. You got you got to mess with your fingernails. They'll grow out there so long you can't eat. You got to mess with your uh, uh, house. You got to paint it. Uh, that's that's the the book of Judges. Uh, man left to himself is a mess. Uh, think about it. Think about it. Let's think about this for a minute. God makes the world, right? He made it perfect. Made everything perfect. He puts a man and a woman in a garden. Where, my goodness, what, what more can you ask for? A perfect man, a perfect woman. He's the most handsome man in the world, only one. She's the most beautiful woman in the world, only one. No competition. She don't have to say, I saw you looking at her. You know, like, uh, he, it's never like, uh, you think he looks better. It wasn't none of that kind of stuff. Absolute perfect environment. They didn't need a house. The weather was perfect. No, no mosquitoes, no flies. I mean, their meals were perfect and fixed for them. They could just grab stuff and eat it. No indigestion, no no problem. They could have babies with no pain and their kids would be perfect and never cause them a problem. Not like the brats we have today or the brats you and I were when we were young. Amen. Uh, their, their kids would have been perfect. Their, everything would have been right. Total respect, total love, happy. I mean, I mean they, they were naked and not ashamed. There was no shame in it. And, all, and, and what does man do? Messes up. Messes it up, don't he? He messes it up. He sinned. The Lord had to kick him out. But what does God do? God has to, he puts clothes on him, kills an animal, makes a sacrifice, puts clothes on him. And then what do they do? They go right back down again. And ain't that about the story of your life? You wasn't worth a dime. You was like a watch laying there. It wouldn't run. And the Lord come along and touched you one day. Thank God that he did. But just as soon as he touches you and you get going, what do you do? You start going down. And then, boy, he'll touch you again. And then you start going down. And you get yourself in a mess and say, Oh, Lord, help me. And he gets you out of another mess. And you get going good again. And then you go down again. Uh, probably 100 times, right? 500, anybody? Uh, it depends on how long you've been saved. It's just a repeat process. If he don't continually touch us, we go down. Church like that. Marriage is like that. Amen. Try telling your wife, or not telling your wife that you love her for 20 years and see what happens. You'll never make it 20 years. Uh, you know, you have maintenance on your wife, maintenance on your husband, maintenance on your kid. That shows that evolution is the biggest bunch of baloney ever pawned off on an unsuspecting public, brother. Amen? It, nothing gets better by itself. Nothing. You say, well, they show an evolution. No, 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 no. They show adaptation. An animal might adapt to its environment. That ain't evolution. But evolution by, their, by that definition happens. Evolution by 
one species changing to another or coming out of nowhere by itself has never been observed and has never happened. Adaptation does happen, but my goodness, I mean, uh, you can stay out in the sun, your skin gets dark. That, that's not evolution. That's adaptation. Uh, you, listen, brother, evolution teaches that man has grown. I don't know what these climate change people are so worried about. If man's always getting better, don't mess it. It'll be all right. We're, get, we're getting better, right? Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, evolution is a lie. It's a lie. If God don't intervene, you get in a mess. Now, the book of Judges is like that. They get in a mess, they call on God, he delivers them. They do real good for a while, get in a mess, call on God, he delivers them. They do real good for a while, get in a mess, call on God, he delivers them. Just like, that's why churches have to have revivals. That's why you have to have spring cleaning. You know, you, you, nobody can even come in here and this, these lights will get dirty, get dust on them by their self. And, and everything's the same way. Um, you know what they done when they messed up there in the Garden of Eden? God clothed them. They went along a little bit further, and they said, you know what? They, we can do better than this. And they evolved all right, got to mess around with them sons of God and them fallen creatures and all kind of crazy stuff. And the Lord says, whoop, had to wipe them all out. He straightened it out again. Noah got out of the ark, him and his three boys and their wives. And now everything's right again. Okay, boys, there's three continents. There's Europe, there's Asia, there's Africa. Go ahead, boys. It's all yours. 150 million square miles each. You know, I mean, take your pick. You want a better opportunity than that? I mean, one goes one way, one goes the other way, and one goes the other way, and all everything start off. What did they do? Messed up again. Messed up again. Tower of Babel, trying to get it all together, one world religion, bam! Lord knocks them down, <laughs> knocked them down, and here they go again, down again, up again, down again, up again. That's the message of the book of Judges. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes, and unless God intervenes, that's a great truth, y'all. I know you just think that you're just listening to an old redneck Bible-believing preacher, which I am, but I'm telling you a tremendous truth that a lot of the world does not even realize. Nothing gets better by itself. Nothing. You say, well, the sun made stuff grow. Give it a while and watch what happens. Give it a while. I've heard people say, well, uh, the law of thermodynamics don't apply to the, our solar system because the sun is an outside force entering it. Okay, leave it out in the sun about a thousand years and, watch, and look at it. See if it gets better. It don't. It don't. Nothing gets better by itself. You can't, chocolate milk don't fix itself. I have no idea why I said that. I'd like to have some. Uh, you can put it in there and mix it. You got, somebody got to mix it up, brother. Somebody got to make your house. Somebody got to do it. Got to have work. All right, with that introduction tonight, let's look at these first uh, few verses. Now, these first couple of chapters are going to be a little bit dull, a lot of historical stuff, and then we're going to get into some of the... Craziest stories in the whole Bible. I mean, lefty, left, fatty have it, and Samson and going to sleep in a long barber shop, and, and uh, the Jephthah's awful vow. They're some of the wildest stories you ever read. They ought to make a series of movies out of this. Now, after the death of Joshua, verse 1. Now, after the death of Joshua, so we know where we're at here, Moses and Joshua's gone, and we're before the kings. Uh, the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up for us against the Canaanites? They're supposed to run them Canaanites out, you know, to fight against them. And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. All right, first thing they did is they asked God. That's a good thing to do. The children of Israel asked the Lord. Now, if you study your Old Testament, a lot of times the way they asked the Lord in the Old Testament, since they didn't have a Bible in the Old Testament, they asked the, the priest, they would ask the high priest, what was the Lord have us to do? And he had that Urim and Thummim. How many of y'all have ever heard of the Urim and Thummim? Raise your hand, okay? Uh, for the rest of you, the high priest wore the Urim and Thummim on, it was like a breastplate, and it had these lights on it, and somehow or another, God would answer their prayer through those lights. I guess the devil Ouija board would be the devil's counterfeit of the Urim and Thummim breastplate. 
but God literally answered them. David did that a time or two. And people did. They would ask God counsel, and he'd give it to the high priest. Things are not like that now, like they were then. You've got to be a dispensationalist. Um, and um, I heard a fellow say that they said, uh, a Jewish rabbi told him, he said, you people call it the Old Testament, we call it the only testament. You know, because they don't believe in the New Testament. And uh, he said, uh, well, you people call it the New Testament, we call it the better testament. That's what Hebrews said. Uh, so there, if you believe in the Old Testament and New Testament, you are a dispensationalist. You can't believe the Bible without being a dispensationalist. We don't have the urine and thumb them now. We don't offer animal sacrifices now. That was different time, different way of dealing with people. God dealt. I don't see how, why it's a problem for people to believe that God deals with people different in different ages. I, I don't see how that could be a problem to people. But you'd be surprised if people, oh, no, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yeah, well, that's so amateur Bible teaching, it ain't even funny. He's the same yesterday and forever, but he don't always deal and work with people the same yesterday today and forever. If he does, we got to build a boat because it's going to rain. See, he don't. He don't. It's different. So they, pro I don't know if they asked that way or not, but they asked the Lord, and the Lord said, Judah, out of all the tribes, I want Judah to go up. Judah's a lion swept, you know. I've delivered the land into his hand. You know what that said in verse 2? God said, I've done, this is a done deal. All you got to go and do is go up there and take it. Man, I'd like to go into a fight knowing I was guaranteed the victory, wouldn't you? And that's what we can do if you're right. I'd, I'd like to go, I, you know, uh, when I, I, I watch uh, basketball, a lot of times I don't get to watch the real game, but sometimes they, on, they'll rerun it. And, and it's not, I'd sit there and I already know who's going who's to win. They're out there fighting their heads. I was like, <laughs> I know what the score is going to be. That's the way the Lord is. He already knows the end from the beginning. And he said, I'm going to do this for you. Now go for it. Grab the victory. And, and he said, go up. But still, you know what they did? They did the same thing me and you did. They doubted. Look what he did. And Judah said unto Simeon, his brother, come up with me. The Lord never told Simeon to go. He told Judah to go. And he went and asked his brother, which may show a little bit of doubt there, that we may fight against the Canaanites, and then when it comes your turn, I'll go with thee into thy lot. See there in verse 3? So Simeon went with him. Now Simeon's an interesting character in the Bible. Uh, each one of those tribes had a prophecy on them. In Genesis 49, every tribe, uh, they, they had a prophecy on that tribe, which follows them all the way through history for the most part. And he was a fighter. Simeon was a fighter. And uh, he don't increase in numbers much like the other tribe. He's a fighter. In, uh, in Genesis 42, Joseph picked Simeon uh, to be prisoners and, and to work uh, with, with, with them. And, and the judges, there's no, there's no record of uh, him during, the, uh, during some of these battles and stuff. But anyway... He asked Simeon to go with him to fight. Now verse 4, And Judah went up, and the Lord delivered them, just like he said, the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand, and they slew them in Bezek 10,000 men. And they found Adonai Bezek in Bezek. Where would you expect Adonai Bezek to be? And they fought against him, and they slew the Canaanites in the Perizzites. Let me mention one thing right quick. Verse 6, But Adonai Bezek fled, and they pursued after him, and caught him and cut off his thumbs and great toes. It's already starting to get weird. They cut off both his thumbs and both of his big toes. Before we talk about that, Adonai Bezek, Bezek is a different character than that other Adonai Zedek, I believe it's pronounced. There's another fellow back there Adonai Zedek that's different than Adonai Bezek. Now, the reason I mention that, um, I, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. So remind me of that. Here's a guy named Adonai Bezek. Here's another guy named Adonai Bezek. Is that a contradiction in the Bible? Is that a mistake in the Bible? No. Like, there's one named John, J-O-H-N. There's one named John, J-O-N. Sean 
S-E-A-N, Sean, S-H-A-W-N, uh, uh, different ways of spelling different people. Now, he took this king in verse 6 of chapter 1, and they cut off his thumbs and his great toes. And Adonai Bezek said in verse 7, three score and ten kings, having their thumbs and their great toes cut off, gathered their meat under my table, as I have done, so God hath requited me. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. All right. So they got this king. They captured this king. And they said, look. He said, please don't kill me. Please don't kill me. Please. They said, all right. We're going to have mercy on you. We'll just make a dog out of you. And he said, all right. Wham. There goes off that thumb. Wham. Wham. There goes that. So there's what he's got now. And then they take something and cut off both his toes. And you know, you know your big toes is what you balance with, right? And I, you, people, you can't even walk, barely walk, without your big toes. You just sort of just, they're like, and they wound up under his table like dogs eating a little bit of meat under, the do, under his table. That's what it said. So they wound up, it reduced him to an animal. And they took, he had took three score and ten kings and cut their big toes and their thumbs off. So an animal has four fingers. You've heard me preach on that before. Now, there are um, a chimpanzee, some animals that have what they call that fifth digit, uh, like a little, and that's the closest thing an animal has. But most animals have four fingers or a paw. And a bird has a claw. See how that thumb comes out there at a right angle like that? that? You know why God put that on there? So we can grab stuff, see? You can grab, you can hold things like that. You, can, you try to do that. Try to, if, if, try to grab a fish and hold it with four fingers without using your phone. A wet, slippery, strong fish about that long. You can't do it. You can't do it. You see, that thumb makes us different from an animal. God, God made man uh, with that thumb there, and you cut that thing off, you get rid of about 90% of the use of your hand. There ain't much you can do. We're just like claws. And you're under the table, couldn't work. You couldn't fight. You couldn't hold a sword. You couldn't chase somebody down and hit them, you know. You, you was rendered as an animal. And they took these guys and they cut their thumbs off and both toes off. It's already getting weird. It's going to get a lot weirder when we get on over there. But I want you to notice something this king said. Verse 7, he said, Their thumbs and great toes cut off, gathered meat under my table, like, a, like an animal. Just throw them little scraps here and there. And he had done that, and then they turned around and done it to him. And look at what he said. A heathen king had more God sense than our modern-day comedians, athletes, professors, and college educators. He said, as I have done, so hath God requited me. Isn't that something that that old boy knew? He said, this is what I got coming to me. I did it to them, and now God's doing it to me. He had more sense. You know, a lot of times heathens got more sense than we think they do, people. These educated people, one, they ain't got much sense. They said, well, it just happened. You can't say that's God. You can't. That old boy said, I've done it to them, and here it comes back to me. You know what I believe? You know me. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm overboard believing that everything that comes down your way, something comes coming back from somewhere. Something bad happened, well, it's coming back to you. Come, come. You, you, you chickens come home to roost. Ain't that right? Amen? What goes around, it sure does. Now, the world don't believe that. They believe it's karma. They believe if you'll just speak positive things, nothing bad will ever happen. The Bible said whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. You better remember that. That boy said, I cut their toes off. Now they cut my toes off. You watch these people that do people wrong. Keep your eye on them down the road somewhere. Watch what happens. It always comes back. It always. Who that rolleth a stone, it'll return. It's like rolling a stone up a hill. It'll, it'll come back down and roll over you. And that old boy, he was a heathen and said, God hath requited me. Isn't that amazing? They had an, an amazing sense of the sovereignty and the, and the righteousness of God that I'm getting what I deserve. He said, they, I cut their toes and thumbs off, so now they cut my toes and thumbs off. 
and we could all tell story after story after story of, of history of when that, when that thing uh, come to pass, okay? Now, let's go on a little bit further here. Verse 8, look at this. this. I think this is very interesting if you study the Bible. Now, the children of Judah had fought against Jerusalem. Wow. How many of you heard me teach about the law of first mention? That's the first mention of Jerusalem in the Bible. And look what it says. And smitten it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. First time it's mentioned. Don't ever forget that. Mark that verse. You know why they're fighting over there tonight? Because the first, God's, it, it's amazing. Look at Jerusalem. Look at the word Jerusalem. Cover up those first four words, letters. What you got? Salem. You know what Salem means, right? Peace. The city of peace. And that city, Jerusalem, has been attacked and destroyed and tore all to pieces more than any other city in history. 27 times on record that city has been attacked. I've got a list of them that I could get you. I mean, it started out way back in the Bible Hyphens in the Bible, then the New Testament, and then right on down through history, even into the 1900s, that city's been attacked. No city has been tore all to pieces more than that city. Rome, uh, around 10 times, but the ancient city of Jerusalem, 27 times. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, something like that. That's some place over there, y'all. That's some, and you look at Jerusalem on the map, it's just a little place. I mean, it's little. And here's all these continents, three continents around us, right in the middle of them three continents. I told you about a minute ago. Europe, Asia, Africa, right here. And there sits Jerusalem, the city of peace. The city of peace has not had nothing but war for 4,000, almost, almost 5,000 years. What? It's the first time it mentions it. It talks about the edge of the sword and the city's going to be set on fire. First time. And the Pope, they said not too long ago, that he longed for the day that Jerusalem would be the great place where Christians and Jews and Muslims could all be together in one big happy family. Well, I got news for him. It ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. They ain't never going to be no Christians, Muslims, and Jews live happily ever after. They're going to fight the edge of the sword. That's what they still do now. They're still doing that now, taking swords into Jerusalem and fighting, cutting heads off, and, and they, they're setting the city on fire. That's the way, they, that's the way them, they fight, swords and setting stuff on fire. And God said, you, you say, well, Brother Danny, why does he call it the city of peace? Because he ain't done with it yet. And one of these days, the Prince of Peace will come. And when that long-awaited day comes, there will be peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. He'll sit on the throne at Jerusalem and rule this world for 1,000 years. They don't believe that much no more. That's called premillennial doctrine, which means we believe there's going to be a 1,000-year millennial reign on this earth. Uh, all the all the mega churches, all the contemporary churches, they get it confused. Saying, we're reigning now, praise God, we're in the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. We ain't in no kingdom. We are in the spiritual kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven ain't here yet. It's coming. It's coming. He said, you know what the Lord told him one time? He said, uh, uh, if, if my kingdom were this world, my servants would fight. But he said, my, as of right now, my kingdom's not of this world. But hallelujah, one of these days, it's going to be. It's going to be of this world. It's going to be of this world. So uh, I thought that was real a blessing to me when I studied today. The law of first mention, there it is again, like beer, like uh, the number 13, all those great studies you can do. The study of Jerusalem is all through history, swords and fighting and burning things down and blowing stuff up. And boy, has that ever been the case ever since that first word. Verse 9, And afterward the children of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites that dwelt in the mountain and in the south and in the valley. 
and Judah went against the Canaanites that dwelt in Hebron. All right, here we go again. Hebron. You see that a lot in the Old Testament. Now the name of Hebron before was Kirjoth Arba, which they slew Sheshai and Ahimean and Talmai, and I don't know if that's right or not, but it's close. Now, Hebron, I want to show you something here. It said Hebron was before Kirjath Arba. They changed the name. So that means sometimes cities change their name down through history. And when you say, where so-and-so, you can't find it on the map because it, it, it's still there, but it's got a different name. Maybe some of you real smart folks can help me with that, like um, North Ireland and, and, and South Ireland. Yeah, Istanbul. I think I had that wrote down. You're right. You're right. You're right. How'd you know that? <laughs> oh, I thought you. <laughs> Amen. Uh, Hebron, the name Hebron is the same city as Mamre. You remember seeing M-A-M-R-E, Mamre, same place. Kirjath Arba, Genesis 23, 19. You see, and that's what makes people think, well, there it called it Hebron, there it called it Mamre, and there it called it Kirjath Arba. What, why does it say three different names? Yeah, right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, there is no Persia now, right? Nowadays. And people say, well, well, see, there's a contradiction in the Bible. That, no, you're just, you're just crazy and don't know it. You're, you're, you're not reading it. It's like... like um, Los Angeles, that's one name. L.A., same place. City of the Angels, same place. Hellhole, same place. <laughs> See, that's four names for the same city. That's right. And, and just because some, sometimes a city will be called, uh, it's amazing how stuff just comes like that, isn't it? Uh, uh, Horeb. Horeb is Mount Sinai. So when you read Horeb, Mount Sinai is the same place. Sometimes all that stuff gets confusing. I, I get confused all the time about Jews and Jerusalem and Zion, Mount Zion, uh, the city of the great king. And some of that stuff is different names for the same place. Um, and, and, and you'll learn to... You know, to, to get that as you, uh, as you study. And I actually had that wrote down. Constantinople is Istanbul now. Uh, what, isn't that interesting? You should learn. You should know that. But anyway, I want to show you one more thing here, and our time's gone. show you one more thing. Look at verse 11. And from thence he went against the inhabitants of Deber, and the name of Deber, I don't know what that is, Morgan it maybe, before was Kirjath Sefer. And Caleb said, He that smiteth Kirjath Sefer and taketh it, to him will I give Asheth my daughter to wife. There's an Old Testament custom. People, nowadays people say, Oh, I can't believe it. Male chauvinists, those poor girls didn't even have a choice. But you've you got to understand the way the things were then. It was a, a patriarchal society. And, and the daddy, he was like, like the head, head man, man. And I, I doubt... I don't think they forced a girl, you got to marry him, and he drug her by the hair of the head, and all that, you know, it was, it was, it was, daddy knows best, and he's prayed about this, and, and I don't agree with that, and I don't think we should do it now, but honest to the Lord, some girls would have been a lot better if all fit let their daddy pick him. Ain't that right? Thought you might. I'm just trying to keep you balanced out, you know, so you don't get overboard. And I don't think I've heard preachers say they picked their. I don't. I didn't pick my son-in-law. Are you kidding? Uh, uh, <laughs> I'd still been looking if I'd have picked them. There wasn't no guy good enough for my girls. But uh, you know, you know what I mean. Back then, things were different, y'all. Different society, different. A woman completely depended on her husband for everything. She'd starve to death without him. And that's the way they lived out in tents. And, dead, and he had to make the living. And she bore children. And things were different back then. 
you say, well, I'll tell you one thing. I, well, I don't, I'm not saying it's great back then, but I don't see too many happy women now since you're the boss. Preach it, brother. It's amazing how it just comes in there, ain't it? When you pray that, you say, I don't believe the Lord's giving you that, brother Danny. Okay, you think the devil is? You got to decide. Anyway, uh, they, he, he, give, he, he done what he's supposed to, and he give him his daughter to wife. I think it would be like them guys wanting to marry my daughter. Though. I told you all, Jeremy, I always told him, I said, now, they got to ask me before, you know, he's supposed to ask me first. Can I have your daughter's hand? You know, you're supposed to ask. Man's got any guts? We'll ask the daddy first. So I was, I was somewhere one day off preaching. I got a text on my phone, and, and Jeremy says, "I was wondering." I could just hear his voice because that's the way he talks. He's real country. I was wondering if you cared if I give Carissa a ring for Christmas. I said, "I want to say." Uh, are you asking me, do you want to get married? Is that what you're saying? I mean, speak up, son. And, uh, and uh, I said, well, we'll talk about it when I get home. <laughs> Let him sweat it out a little while. But uh, uh, anyway, I, I didn't say you've got to marry him. Whosoever cometh over and moweth my grace all summer, him will I give my daughter to wife. It, it, what? It wasn't like that. I did make him spread mulch. I did. And, the, and the, him and Wesley come up to the house. They stayed up at the house for about two years, every night, and they wrestle in the living room floor and fix pizza. And I about run them. I did run off one a time or two. Run Todd off one time. Uh, uh, sure did. Run him off one time. Run Wesley off one time. Uh, but Jeremy, he always sort of, you know, behaved himself more. And And... But back then, back then it wasn't like it wasn't like they all went to school, met hundreds of people, and dated, and then they did, it wasn't like that. It was like you lived in a hut, and they lived in a hut ten mile down the road. Lord, they wasn't but two girls in town. And they was buck tooth, and, and you know, and, and hump back, and everything else. You know, that guy said she was so buck tooth she could eat an apple through a chain link fence. But uh, <laughs> but uh, you know what? It, so don't don't find fault with the Bible and talk about how terrible people were uh, back then and everything. They, they ain't as bad as people are now. And I'm not saying we should operate like that now. It's impossible now. That's right. So that speaks well of the, of the guy, of the man, her husband. It does. And, uh, and I, you know... Things were different back then. Patriarchal society. All right, anybody else? I'm going to stop right there. I do want to show you one more thing. Verse 19, we're going to skip a little bit. You see Gaza, Gaza, the Gaza Strip there in verse 18? Still around today. Uh, we'll talk about that later. I don't know if it's the same exact spot. But anyway, with the coast thereof, Gaza Strip. Verse 19, and the Lord was with Judah, and he drove out the inhabitants of the mountain but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley. That's interesting. Study on that between now and next week. It mentions that again because they had chariots of iron. Now, the truth is God told him he'd do it. He could drive them people out of the mountain, but he couldn't get them out of the valley. That's why the people say the God of the mountain, still God of the valley. Somehow or another, we get it in our head when we're everything going good and everything, he's the God of the mountain. But when we get in the valley, sometimes we... Wimp out and doubt and have a lot of doubt. That's what happened to him. Study about that until next week. All right? Let's bow our heads for prayer.